High elves are an essential part of the fabric of Warhammer Fantasy. Some might say that they are even one of the most important parts of the setting. Having made a few videos now that have looked at the high elves, I've come to gain a greater appreciation for their role and place in the story. Although many people tend to think of the Empire as being the protagonist faction in the setting, I think I would be inclined to make that case for the high elves. Warhammer Fantasy does not have a protagonist faction really, not in the same way that the Imperium is the protagonist faction in Warhammer 40k, but I do think that the High Elves are very closely up there for consideration. So this video is part one of a series of videos that is going to be looking at the High Elven military, examining its development and its history, and trying to explain it within the wider context of the setting. I want to try and approach this topic by looking at the development of the High Elven military in terms of its military context and try to explain how and why these choices were made at the time that they were being made. Also, I want to consider alternative explanations and counterfactuals to further enhance this series. I don't simply want to provide you with a representation of the lore from the wiki. I do want to try and add some original ideas on my own as well. Where possible, I think it would be good to incorporate information from real-world sources to try and provide additional context for the opinions that I'm going to give. I don't work for Games Workshop, I'm not an authoritative source, I just find it interesting, and I hope you do too. Finally, over the course of this series, I also want to try and develop an argument towards the idea that the High Elves are the first and only superpower in a geopolitical sense present in the Warhammer fantasy world. But that, I think, is going to be a very interesting topic, and something that I hope you will find interesting as well. Firstly, Games Workshop play fast and loose with numbers, and that makes pure numbers a fool's errand. If the writers of a particular story need to say, for example, that a battle was terrible, they might give any sort of number of casualties that they feel is appropriate. While this makes for interesting storytelling, it doesn't really make for interesting demographic reading. Whether or not the actual population of elves at that point could sustain those kinds of casualties is not important, because the point of writing this kind of fiction is to not invent realistic demography, but to tell engaging stories. I will try to, where possible, stick to more con concrete information, but I do think it's necessary to take everything with some salt. Secondly, this series does not undo or change my opinions about things like the War of the Beard. The High Elves still lost that war, quite badly, I would say. Multiple things can be true at the same time, and we should consider that. Finally, I will be referring to the High Elves and Elves in an interchangeable manner. I know that there are Wood Elves and Dark Elves, but you can assume that when I am talking about Elves, without specifying that I am referring to High Elves. So, let's start with the beginning. Before we can really talk about the High Elven military, I think it's important to understand what the High Elves are and where they come from. Most of the model races in Warhammer Fantasy are essentially the creations of a race of primordially ancient beings called the Old Ones. At some point in the distant past, the Old Ones created most of the races that we find in the Warhammer world and shaped it to suit the need of these creatures. Their first creation, the Lizardmen, were given the jungle continent of Lustria. The Elves, the second major race to be created, were instead given the island of Ulthuan. The elves themselves are also quite gifted from a biological perspective. Like elves from Lord of the Rings, Warhammer elves are very long-lived, but not necessarily immortal. Their bodies do not suffer from infirmities like humans do, however, and as a result, elves can easily live for hundreds to possibly a thousand years. Elves are generally tall and slim, being taller on average than humans, and slimmer. You might be tempted to think that that makes elves weaker than humans, but that's not the case. In Warhammer Fantasy, Units are given a strength and toughness rating to indicate a measure of their physical abilities. The standard baseline human strength and toughness is 3. That's also the standard toughness and strength of elves. Even though elves don't look it, they're just as strong and tough as baseline humans. A biologist might even venture to guess about the density of their muscle fibers, but since I'm not one, I won't. Where elves do stand out, however, is in their reflexes. In previous editions, elves usually had very good quality high initiative which of course is a stat that governed when they could strike in combat. High initiative means that you can strike before your opponent can, and kill them before you yourself are killed. Even in the old world, although they've lost that universal always strikes first rule, the elves still retain significant initiative advantages. While this is certainly extremely useful to an individual warrior, these advantages start to compound when you think about the elven mental acuity in a broader sense. As elves can live a very long time, 
they can learn a lot from their experiences. While an individual elven warrior can have hundreds of years of experience, elven commanders can have hundreds of years of command experience, magnifying their already good attributes of the soldiers under their command. The elves aren't without issues though, their main social weakness is probably their pride. That's caused their species an endless amount of grief over the years. There are other issues we will cover in later parts of the series. So, we see here that they have many ideal components for making an army, so let's talk about how we actually got there. It's important to note that before the first Great Chaos invasion, the High Elves of Ulthuan did not have a military. There was, simply put, no need for one. The island that they were given is largely a paradise. Sure, there are some dangerous creatures, but nothing as severe as the things you might find in abundance in the Old World. So when the first Chaos invasion happened, and it was largely led by demons, the Elves were caught unawares and unprepared. It was Anerion, a hero and traveler of some repute, who returned home to find his nation in ruins. He had then forged the first elven military. The elves had had a martial aspect, they just needed to be shaped towards it. We don't know much about the first high elven military, but we can infer some things. Firstly, the elves were already known to use the bow and spear. These are common and useful hunting weapons, so much so that Anerion used one to kill a greater demon. So it makes sense, then, that the High Elves would naturally build their army on this foundation. Archers and Spearmen, one of the oldest military systems both in our world and in Warhammer Fantasy. It also makes some sense when you think about their opponents. The Demons of Chaos wear very little armor generally, relying on their numbers and their own supernatural toughness. Mass ranks of archers can shower a battlefield with arrows and inflict casualties on these demons who might not necessarily have the armor to protect them. Meanwhile, ranks of spearmen can hold off these demons and their charges by presenting a well-ordered disciplined shield wall. Of course, we're missing an important part. Anerion wasn't the only hero of this era. In fact, arguably, the most important hero is actually another figure, Kalidor the Dragon Tamer. Aside from his many talents for magic, Kalidor was also instrumental in brokering a friendship with the many dragons who called Ulthuan home. These dragons, much more numerous and mighty in, than in their current time, were a major source of power for the High Elven military. They provided a mobile, resilient, destructive force that could oppose the armies of demons. Dragon fire, of course, does burn hot enough to melt demon flesh. Together, a military trifecta formed, one that would essentially last for a thousand years. Given the scope and severity of the invasion, and the fact that it lasted hundreds of years, it is important to emphasize that this army is one produced of convenience. Its soldiers are some combination of feudal levies, because high elven society is essentially feudalistic in nature, and volunteers. Existential threats to your species are remarkably good at motivating people to sign up for military service. But it's not exactly what one would call a professional army. That's for a later date. But hopefully you can see that the high elves started their military history with a lot of natural, biological, and social advantages. It's no small feat that their military system would become the de facto military system for most of the world's history after that point. It's also important to note that the High Elves had successfully repelled the demons for hundreds of years. So obviously, I should point out here that the High Elf military system is very obviously based on the military systems of the ancient world. We can draw parallels even to the style of armor to groups like the Achaemenid Persian Empire, with their use of heavy cavalry, chariots, archers, and spearmen. Of course, the Elves are just naturally better than humans when it comes to their physical attributes, so the elven army is much more coordinated and composed than a real human army could ever hope to be. It's a very interesting question to why the elven army is largely the same after thousands of years. Warhammer Fantasy is a setting that defies much in the way of change. The elves also have a conservative culture, and their military system largely works, so why change it? As we get along into this series, I'll try to take a look at some alternative evolutionary paths that the high elves could have taken, but didn't. So this brings us to the end of part one. I hope you enjoyed it. I must admit a growing fascination with the High Elf faction. I hope to be able to make more parts of this series. Like and comment below what you think so far. Subscribe for more videos. We are slowly ticking up to 1000. Let's see if we can get there. Thank you for listening and goodbye.